<laughs> so Benji, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's lovely to be here. Yeah, it's a fantastic conference as, you, as you're learning and a great conference. Um, I know we've already talked about fun this morning and the idea of having pleasure. And obviously, uh, you are, are both a comedian and a psychiatrist, and you mentioned in your book the importance of fun in, in medicine and humor. And I'd like you just maybe to expand on that, because it is great fun, uh, medicine is, and working as a practitioner. Yeah, I mean, certainly, uh, it's sometimes hard to find the fun in psychiatry, but I think because it is depression and anxiety and PTSD, as you said, but I think there is a, people have already alluded to it today, you really need at times gallows humor to survive often, and sometimes even with it, you might not. So, um, yeah, I often use humor. I think it's not a coincidence I started being a psychiatrist at the same time that I started training. Sorry, a comedian at the same time I started training yeah. as a psychiatrist. Yeah, because I, I often know, we, we often debrief, and often you tell humorous stories. Um, we obviously get them to sign GDP or consents so that we're allowed to share the story with the patient. <laughs> but uh, um, it's a real great way of debriefing and de-stressing and putting things into perspective. Yeah. I think so. I mean, Freud was identified humor as one of the more mature defenses, and I think it does help to make the, the intolerable more tolerable. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I suppose I, I'm using humor more recently on a, in a less selfish way, but I guess I think it has wider uses. I think it can be very useful to help get our health messages across to a, to a wider population. So that's what I guess I'm trying to do more recently with my, my writing. And I think we're going to start off, you're going to give actually give one of your chapters. Um, so I'll yeah. hand over to you if you want to give a reading. Yeah, let's do that. What, just to give you a bit of context, folks. So the book is, um, yeah, you don't have to be mad to work here. And um, it starts off, I suppose, with my kind of, in, in, in a, my medical school interview with my kind of fluffy-haired idealism, saying how I want to help people. And then the chapter I'm going to read to you, I guess, is about three quarters of the way through the book, where I'm now working as a uh, registrar psychiatrist in London in 2019. I think I'll stand up for this just to put some energy into it. The staff kettle flicks. Into a mug, I had two tea bags for double the hip, the boiled water, and a good glug of blue top belonging to someone called Alison, knowing I'm the only one here at 4 a.m. I trudged back along the top floor of decrepit, empty doctor's offices. Such is my status as a junior, my office is a windowless cupboard room, or more accurately, a cupboard. I've tried to personalize it with a plant on my desk to symbolize life. It's a cactus, though, so specifically desert life, surviving on the bare minimum, a fitting NHS metaphor. Our team secretary, Mandy, a gardening enthusiast, keeps moving it into the corridor, citing that it needs natural light, although no one seems particularly bothered that I'm in here five days a week. <laughs> Above my desk is a bookshelf which visually charts the evolution of my career. Each year that a patient or their relative doesn't try to sue me, my medical insurance company gifts me a £10 book voucher. <laughs> At one end of the shelf is the first book I optimistically bought called Positive Psychiatry. Further along, in the middle, is Prozac Nation. And at the other end, chronologically, is this year's purchase, Matt Haig's Reasons to Stay Alive. <laughs> Every day, around 100 psychiatrists attend to the troubled minds of North, South, East, or West London. However, at night, there's only five. Because if there's one thing the mentally ill are famous for, it's long contented sleeps. <laughs> The on-call team consists of one junior doctor at each of the three psychiatric hospitals, a more senior junior doctor called a registrar, that's me, advising them all over the phone whilst rushing between A&Es reviewing psychiatric emergencies. And if I get stuck, there's a consultant on-call at home available for telephone advice. Footnote, junior doctor is the confusing umbrella term used for any medic who isn't yet a consultant. Being a junior doctor can be grim, but thankfully, at least according to television, but, um, when I become a consultant, someone from HR will give me an Aston Martin and some golf clubs. <laughs> the warmth of the mug in my hands is a small comfort. I slurp my tea and fall into my chair for the first time this shift. Seven hours down, six to go. I've seen eight patients already, sectioned five of them, and written precisely zero notes. Envious of my sleeping computer, I stir it into life. Then I begin writing the notes for the person who took an overdose of 99 paracetamols because... I bought a hundred, but dropped one on the floor, and it got germs on it. <laughs> <laughs> a 
A round of applause for suicide, okay. <laughs> Only a couple of words in, my on-call telephone rings again. For God's sake, please stop calling me, I implore the handset. It's good people can't hear the few seconds before you pick up the phone. Hello, this is psychiatry, how can I help you? I say, magically changing personality. A blunt, harassed a &E matron on the other end makes a referral. Got one for you, she says. Maybe I should have been a surgeon. No one ever talks to them like that. Sorry, one. There are some healthcare workers who don't just limit their disdain for mental health to the patients. I think it's born of helplessness. It's hard to patch up lifelong psychological problems within an emergency department's four-hour target. A psych patient, love. You're the psych registrar on call, aren't you? Yes, I am. Can I have some more information, please? Down the phone, I hear an irritated sigh, like I've asked for a last Rolo. <laughs> then the rustling of notes on a background of beeping machines which reassure staff their patients are still alive. 34-year-old jumped off suicide bridge, she says. Sleep deprived, my brain wonders. Shouldn't the council rebrand suicide bridge? <laughs> Something more chipper like, don't do it viaduct or things will get better overpass. <laughs> Dr. Waterhouse? Sorry, yes, I'm here. I sense the opportunity to bounce this on so I can finally make a dent in my paperwork and maybe even drink this cuppa. Aren't they for medics? I take it they um, survive. Oh, you're good. Yeah, they're landing in some thorn bushes, luckily, depending on how you think about it. Just lots of superficial cuts that plastics have sutured and a fractured wrist that orthopedics have put in a pot, so they're ready for you. I eye my mountain of paperwork. I have one more card up my sleeve, one more opportunity to make this somebody else's problem. Which side of the bridge did they jump off? <laughs> what? Did they jump off the north side facing the church or the south side facing the shopping center? It's just that bridge divides the north and south crisis teams. We're the north one. <laughs> Jesus Christ, she groans. I hear a rustle through ambulance notes, so hopeful I check my texts. On my family WhatsApp group seven hours earlier, I see my artist brother Josh shared a picture of his latest painting. My mum has replied with her usual enthusiasm and emojis. Amazingly, my dad must have had his phone charged and switched on, and below his text of encouragement, he signed off from dad like a letter. Mm. The nurse is still audibly searching through paperwork, so next, I check the BBC Sport website. Leicester beat Southampton 9-0. Found it, the matron says eventually. Okay, smells strongly of alcohol. Away from home, too. Saying they want to die. Another hat trick for Jamie Vardy. Best <laughs> friend died yesterday. He has to start for England now. Discovered, discovered by a dog walker in St. Martin's Church car park. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Mm. <laughs> now it's my turn to sigh. Okay, yeah, that hours. I open the National Online Database Care Notes, which is like a Facebook for psychiatric patients. What's the NHS number, I ask? I punch the numbers 453-679-2119 into the system, click search, and snatch a, glump, a gulp of tea whilst the archaic computer loads. Then a name appears, one I know. If my life were a film, at this point I'd drop my mug, the shattered ceramic bouncing off the carpet in slow motion. I'd probably wail and scream and pull up my hair too, but there's nothing cinematic about it. No filter, no ambient music, just grim real life. Nowadays, I absorb, I absorb the most extreme emotions of shock, fear, or sadness with a robotic professionalism. It's easier if you don't feel too much. Numbness, my medical armor. Be there shortly, I say automatically. Then I rush off to A&E, leaving the steaming cup of tea on my desk amongst the graveyard of other half-drunk ones. That's that chapter. So I love that chapter. I mean, I, I think it's actually great because we're on the 100th uh, anniversary of Ulysses, James Joyce, which the Irish are very proud of. And you've incorporated stream of consciousness in part of your book, which is similar to Ulysses. So delighted to see that. And I love also the way you uh, personalize the phone because uh, I've always believed that phones are evil little creatures designed to make doctors' lives hell. And, uh, and we just talked about that today. Do you mind me talking about that? I've been on the other side of psychiatry where I've tried to get patients because I, I work in homelessness, so we do a lot of compulsory admissions. And uh, I've often said calling a psychiatrist on call is sometimes um, someone answers the phone and says, hello, how can I not help you? Mm. And uh, 
the interesting thing is that, you know, it happens with so many psychiatrists that it can't be the people, it has to be the system. And you talk a little bit about the system. Do you want to talk about, yeah? Yeah, well, when I first started my career, I saw these quite cold, seemingly uncaring bosses of mine, and I promised never to turn into mm -hmm. them, or I think I thought they had always been like that. And I suppose one of the themes of the book is my evolution from this very well-meaning, seemingly empathic, caring person, but under the constraints of the system, struggling to even offer any marginally decent care for the guys who were already on my books, yeah. this um, culture that comes in whereby people are just trying to not take, thinking of any out to not take on work, just so yeah. they can keep their head above water more often than not. So it's just the pressure of the system has caused them to act I like this. I think yeah. so. I think so. Although, you know, I, th I suppose another possible explanation, I think some research does suggest that over time, slightly worryingly, doctors do become less empathic. Yeah. Um, perhaps they become decent, desensitized after a while or they become more burnt out or whatever it is. But I, I don't think it's just that. I think it's the, the pressures more often than not. Okay, we become more expert and not caring. As such, uh, following Roger Kneebones, we've become journeymen to not caring. Um, and we talked about burnout, obviously, and we've mm. talked about that already. And uh, interestingly, too, you also talk about at the other side, not just the fact on doctors of the system, but you talk, you have a very poignant story about this patient with schizophrenia called Malcolm. And you describe, actually, uh, what I found very poignant, how he went into hospital with a girlfriend and came out eight months later alone. And you said that uh, you see him every so often but because he's in the category of doing well, you just see him just literally very infrequently, and you felt that was a shamefully low bar. And it just struck me, particularly after um, Ian and Ash talking about the idea that, you know, love is paying attention to someone, and that we give them attention. And in a way, it sounded to me like your shamefully low bar was you haven't the time to give attention to patients. Yeah. I think so, and, I, and maybe in our very defensive world nowadays, a, a psychiatrist, a lot of their, their main anxiety with the culture, we've been brought up doing these risk assessments and trying to predict suicide and homicide. So unfortunately, with a serious mental illness like suicide, yeah. a lot of the time, as long as no one is endangered, but as a, people are kind of happy with that and they'll just sign them off to see you in six months or maybe even just discharge mm. you. But yeah, Malcolm was a guy who, bless him, I said to him when I saw him in the pandemic, I'd never met him before, I said, how are you coping with lockdown, with this lockdown? And he said, you know, give in mind the, the what everyone had already lost and he said to me well it's, it's just the same as always mm -hmm. you know we'd already lost everything that we lost during that lockdown and um yeah so uh it would be nice if we could offer a care beyond just are you going to kill someone or yourself please and if you had that magic wand to provide the type of care you'd like to provide to someone like malcolm like what would you like to do in terms of um the service you'd like to provide mm. Well, I, we talked about this a bit when we yeah, were eating last, last night, night yeah. you know, it's like a lot of people, there is a, a chronic shortage of psychiatrists. I don't necessarily think psychiatrists are the solution. And we were saying how sometimes psychiatrists are described as social workers with stethoscopes. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't see that as a slight, you know, I think a lot of what we, a lot of the problems, a lot of the, what we call mental health problems in society often stem from poverty or, or crap lives, really. So prevention in the first instance through um, you know, education and housing and opportunities and purpose in life would be my, where I would go. But I suppose until that utopia is achieved, yeah. psychiatrists will just have to do. Just have to do. Um, and uh, you, you also, um, in terms of Malcolm, you were, you were, um, uh, you, were you're, you know, you, you, I'm going to have to forget where I was on that one. <laughs> Might as well learn up. Um, yeah, no, so we talked about, you were saying last night that you're actually going to move into a type of branch of psychiatry where you become the first person to assess someone. So it's first line assessment. And you felt in a way it was to try, and you felt that was so important because you think we come to diagnosis too easily. That's basically uh, stigmatize someone for the rest of their lives and sort of define the rest of their lives. Well, certainly with, with words as stigmatized as schizophrenia, like one of the, the things in that, mm is when Malcolm, it, he's telling me how he spent, I ask him how does he spend his mm. time, and he, he just walks from his kitchen to his living room and then back to his kitchen, then his living room, and that's his, like, that's his exercise, basically. And I was thinking, well, he used to be a gardener before he became unwell, so maybe we're referring to a community gardening group, which was still going on at the time, and I, ref and I called, and the, the person on the other end of the phone said, yeah, oh, great, like, um, yeah, we're always open to volunteers. And then when I told 
the, then the hospital I was calling from, then um, she cooled a lot and then said, oh, you do know we are like, we should, mm. you do know we are an open garden, like will he be safe around members of the public and all that sort of sort of nonsense really. And um, sorry for Yeah, no, I had a psychologist only recently who uh, I referred a patient and she came back to me and said, he's on olanzapine. Mm. And she says, yeah, well, we don't deal with people who are psychotic. And I thought it was really interesting just because you have had one mm. psychotic episode and may spend the rest of your life on olanzapine means yeah. they won't see you. So that's it. So yeah. some people find these words that we give to clusters of symptoms helpful, but there's also just as many people who don't. And I think, especially w the work in early intervention, that's people mm. usually their yeah. first episode. If you slap a schizophrenia diagnosis on them, then it's kind of hard to get rid of that. Yeah. Um, like we were saying, is there's also different language. I know like some people call people schizophrenia voice hearers, and in a way it's a much richer way of describing Definitely, and it's also much more authentic because what is, what is schizophrenia? What, is, what are any of our diagnoses but, but, but words we give to things? We still have no objective evidence yeah. for them on any scans or blood tests. So it feels more honest to just to, to describe the symptoms that you experience. Yeah. And it gives a sense of uh, perhaps less, slightly less permanence if you are a voice hearer or hear voices. And then just in the last part of the story, you talk about suddenly you recognize the patient's name and so you rush off and because you suddenly realize it's all that horrible feeling of when we say, oh, like that's the patient we saw last week or the patient we thought was fine. And then, and in a sense, you capture it beautifully. I, one of my favorite sentences that I read was you said, you know, Psychiatry is all probablys and usuallys and hopefully not. And you said that, you know, it's not an exact science and that in a sense, all we have is a clinical assessment, a little hunch and often a prayer. And in a sense, that is, because we've talked about it this morning, again, uncertainty, to me it is, as an educator, is probably the biggest struggle for young doctors today is managing uncertainty. And like you give an example where you almost, you know, the diagnosis of suicide is such a, uh, 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 almost educated guesswork, yeah. Yeah, well, we spend a lot of time learning about risk assessment and fill out all these risk assessment forms, but then the, the evidence for how helpful they are is, is very iffy. And I remember when I first started as a psychiatrist, my boss was teaching me about it, and she was saying, oh, yeah, but it's always the ones you least expect, and which is not very, you know, calming. And then... <laughs> And then also, she would say, and also, it always, it also happens to even the very best psychiatrists. And it's like, right, well, and you would see, I'd see that in my career, people who were so conscientious and caring, and they mm. would have awful, you know, it would all go wrong for their patients. And then you'd see, you'd see in, in, on the other side, people who you would describe as a, a crap psychiatrist, and they seemingly got away with it endlessly. Yeah. So it makes you wonder how, what, how rigorous is all this stuff that we're, we're doing, really? Yeah, and because um, you actually say, as you say, like it, in a sense, there are no uh, sadness markers in blood, to, you know, blood in, in blood tests to diagnose depression. You can't do radiological scans to diagnose anxiety. Or my favourite one is you can't place a stethoscope on someone's forehead and hear the schizophrenia voices. Um, so, in a sense, dealing with that inexactitude means, leave, you know, and people. I think the public expect you to be able to, to make a diagnosis of, of suicidal behaviour, and yeah. Maybe. Well, they expect diagnoses now, don't they? There's this culture of I sense sometimes over medicalization. Yeah. As the conversation has become more mainstream, people identify with these things very, uh, uh, very quickly. And I think that's slightly problematic because then they turn up to psychiatry for the solutions and often we don't have them. You know? Yeah. You have a second piece that you're going to read to us as well now today. Yep. Yeah, so this one, I guess, um, again, these, these chapters are a little bit further on. So these are the slightly less light and frothy ones. These are more the kind of, um, but hopefully they're, they're, they're kind of, they've got some value to them, hopefully especially, especially to a bunch of other doctors in the room because you, you, so this might resonate. So this is when, after everything was going wrong, even the patients who I thought I could keep safe, things were starting to go wrong for I suppose I was becoming quite disillusioned with it all and um, not quite myself. So this is going to see my GP in 2019. I arrived for my emergency GP appointment four days after booking it. A patient of mine said they once telephoned for one because they planned to kill themselves on Christmas Day and they were offered a slot on January the 2nd. <laughs> the clock above reception needs a new battery. The hand for the seconds rhythmically pulsing as though banging its head against an invisible brick wall. 
I make it 7.46 a.m., so I'm technically 14 minutes early, but also several years late. Good morning, I begin, when nothing comes from the receptionist behind the desk. You get a warmer welcome in a pret a than some NHS services. Name, she says flatly. Was it a question? Benjamin. Surname. She must be one of these people who doesn't pronounce the question marks. Waterhouse. Having briefly worked in general practice as a junior doctor, I know what she's doing, completing three boxes which ping through to the GP's computer so he, he or she can brush up on their knowledge beforehand. Patients should never Google their symptoms because then it's just duplication of work when doctors do it. <laughs> I'm ready for her final question. Emergency reason you need to see the GP, she says. I swear louder than before. I turn to the long queue of people behind me. Bored by my slight hesitation, she slurps from a can of energy drink. Um, depression, I almost whisper. She bashes the keyboard, spelling it aloud as she goes. D-E-P-R-E-S. <laughs> How many S's are there in depression? A female patient from behind helpfully chips in with two, as though we're playing <laughs> surgery scrabble. She hits enter, then indicates to take a seat in the waiting room by shouting, next. A copy of this morning's Metro sits on the table. A whole page is devoted to a story of a dog who looks a bit like Gordon Ramsay. On Radio London, an endlessly cheery radio DJ is playing Would You Rather with a listener in Barnet who'd sooner have no knees than no elbows. <laughs> that popular school of getting through life by throwing yourself into the trivial. Like a train station's departure board, our names appear on the waiting room's electronic screen. The receptionist seems to have accidentally entered the reason they're seeing the GP <laughs> into the surname box and vice versa. Because up pings... Trevor hemorrhoids. <laughs> Surprisingly, it's impeccably spelt. <laughs> An old man who mysteriously has been standing by his chair until now shuffles to room two. <laughs> Ten minutes later, it's me, Benjamin Depression. <laughs> I head down the corridor, politely highlighting the mix-up to the receptionist on the way. My NHS strangle-proof lanyard is deliberately tucked under my jumper because now I just want to be a patient. I've tried the doctor heal thyself nonsense, so now I'm seeking a chemical fix. I want to try Prozac to boost my serotonin factory settings and help me get out of bed and into work every morning. Despite prescribing it hundreds of times for my patients, I've never actually considered it for myself. Dr. Smith is etched in a polished brass plate on the front of room two. Inside, I notice subliminally he's already trying to get rid of me. A large, important-looking desk divides us, his swivel chair higher to exert dominance. The window is open to the cold, so I don't linger. I know these tricks as someone who deploys them regularly myself to keep my own seemingly endless line of patients moving. As a rough guide, I gauge a doctor's care by how well they nurture their plants. Dr. Smith doesn't have any. <laughs> how can I help, he asks his computer. Medics don't like being told the answers by patients, so I play dumb as though I don't realize the significance of my symptoms. Um, well, uh, I've just been really tired, not sleeping, just feeling generally rubbish. Okay, he nods thoughtfully to his monitor. Any stress at work, he probes, what is it you do? Bizarrely, the first made-up job that comes to mind is ski instructor. <laughs> Despite the fact my family have never been skiing, I decide to move the conversation on. Also, I say, apropos of nothing, I'm not enjoying stuff and sometimes I think about ending it. It's the first time I've ever really admitted having suicidal thoughts to anyone apart from my therapist, Joseph. The thoughts enter my head involuntarily, like unwanted guests, and I try not to let them get too comfortable or properly come inside. They just hover in the landing, still with their shoes on until I can kick them out. But they've been forced an entry more frequently recently, which in anyone else I'd probably think was depression. I need to pitch it just right with my GP, though. Depressed enough to get medication, but not so depressed that Dr. Smith refers me to my local mental health team. If only because it would be another name on my bulging caseload. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a surreal moment, picking up a referral for myself? I don't think about ending it in a definite way, I clarify, but just kind of, what's the point, you know? 
I've not done anything active to end my life, but I have noticed my previously self-preserving behavior become more reckless. Like when I stopped wearing my helmet or bike lights on my work commute, passively half hoping a heavy goods vehicle wouldn't see me. Dr. Smith looks at me for the first time. He has brown eyes, tired ones. I do know, he says. I'll tell you what, let's get some gloves. I don't pull up my jumper's arm immediately, but worry I'm overplaying the patient role to pretend I don't know how doctors get blood, as though they just wait for women to menstruate or punch men on the nose. <laughs> Roll up your sleeve, please, he says. One sharp scratch later, he's clasping the blood samples he hopes will hold the answer. But unlike other branches of medicine, psychiatry is not so easy. There are no sadness markers in the blood to help diagnose depression. No radiological scan shows anxiety. You can't hear schizophrenic voices with a stethoscope held to a sufferer's forehead. The whole mystery of mental illness is its invisibility to all medical investigations. He hands me a crisis team leaflet, a bizarre moment given I keep a bunch of them at the bottom of my bag. I'll send off these bloods and call you later with the results, he says. Good news, Dr. Smith tells me down the telephone a few mornings later. You've just got low vitamin D. It's not uncommon in the winter months. Collect a prescription from the surgery and you'll feel better in no time. I thank him and hang up bemused. I obediently take my vitamin D tablets. I have lots of unused annual leave too and manage to take some days off to tag along with my housemate Alex and his girlfriend Rach on their Greek beach holiday to boost my body's natural levels. They generously make me feel welcome, even though a depressed friend on a romantic getaway could potentially be a mood killer. <laughs> but even in paradise, I have the thought to topple off the balcony or sink to the bottom of the lagoon-colored swimming pool, which I don't think is a symptom of vitamin deficiency. On return, I book another GP appointment. In the waiting room this time, I notice a poster about the prevalence of depression, illustrated through hundreds of baked beans. One in four, it says and about a quarter of the beans aren't orange. The color they've chosen is remarkably similar to the NHS's iconic shade of blue. I get a different GP this, like, this time, Dr. Ali in room three. I prefer her no frills, more human sign, her name written on a sheet of A4 paper in faded permanent marker, which ran out long ago, white tacked to the door. I learned that it's quite hard convincing someone you're depressed with a full body suntan, but at least she listens. My vitamin D levels have now normalized, yet I tell her the thoughts persist. What's your job, Dr. Ali asks, peering over her spectacles. Her computer monitor is turned away from us and her room is warm, a happy looking cheese plant in the corner. I think about the message to open up like the can of baked beans in the poster. Maybe it's time for a different tack, a dose of honesty. I'm a psychiatrist, I apologize to my shoes. Jesus Christ, she says, I better prescribe you some antidepressants. <laughs> so it's a pity you should have gone to Chris Luke this morning because he probably would have told you I uh, prescribed you a uh, uh, visit to your local nightclub instead. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think it's a, re as I said, it's not just a funny book, it's a, a challenging book and also an honest book. And like I know someone this morning was saying how that one of the best um, ways of, you know, it, the tutorials they had was when someone talked, tell them about their mistakes. Many, very few doctors talk about having the experience of depression themselves and burnout, because I know we were talking last night and you were saying you were feeling a bit burnt out at one stage. So um, um, I'm just curious, like we talk in homelessness, we talk about the idea of experts by experience, as in, you know, when you've been the experience, it changes the way you interact. And I'm just wondering, has the experience of being, um, you know, experienced symptoms such as unhappiness and burnout, has that affected your way of working as a psychiatrist? Well, it's uh, kind of hard to say. But, but basically, after that, at the end of that chapter, I go back home. It, it trans basically, I get the, the medicines, but in the end, I don't take them because I have this thought that actually my issue here is not my brain chemistry, you know, and, and, and I sought to change my environment. And I applied for a uh, career break, I actually put that I wanted to pursue something creative, and obviously that application was rejected. <laughs> and, and it was only when I appealed the decision that I went into, I went in for an appeals meeting, and they, they, they said to me, you look burnt out. Mm -hmm. And so they then ticked, I suppose, the right box, and then I had it approved, but then I had my career break approved. It was only approved at the beginning of March 2020. Oh. Um, yeah. 
So I had a fortnight off, and then I came back. Um, and then, and you know, it's like that thing about, I don't even necessarily know whether I would describe what I had as depression, even. Yeah. You know, I, I said to my, so basically I worked throughout the pandemic, and since August that's just gone, I've had time off, you know, and mm. I feel I've been able to write this book, and I feel better which makes me think it's not a, a, a medical problem in me, mm. you know. It was, it was just this uh, damaging environment in which I was living and working. Um, and it was funny, my therapist, so I see a therapist, I'm very lucky, a lot of psychiatrists are encouraged mm. to see their own therapist yeah. because they have notoriously bad mental health themselves. And uh, I, what I said to my therapist once, I said, do you think I'm depressed? And he said, I think you're an NHS psychiatrist. <laughs> And just on that issue of, of your therapist, because I actually have my own therapist. In fact, he's sitting over there, uh, Patsy Brady. And I was sitting beside me. He was managing my anxiety before I came on stage <laughs> as we talked at the beginning. Um, do you think doctors should have therapists or other forms of, you know, ways of debriefing or, or, or just scaring out the, the emotional trauma that they go through or the, yeah. the stress? Well, I guess Simon Wesley is the, is the guru on debriefing, but I think he thinks that... Um, it's not helpful in uh, straight after the trauma, but then I guess when is the trauma really? It's just kind of endless, really, in yeah. in, in NHS psychiatry sometimes. Um, yeah, I mean we have supervision, but then that's and also we're encouraged to have therapy. But then even therapy, you know, it's like well, I think we have have this quite idealized idea of therapy. We're really it's really. Um, it can be quite tricky, you know, finding job satisfaction in psychiatry because we have very crude pharmacological treatments, you mm. know, that often cause as many problems as they, as they solve. And then we have these wait, people waiting for therapy, yeah. like longer than it like, takes our hospital internet to load. And then it's like, people have this idea that they're going to get in, they're going to get onto the, after years of on a therapy mm. list, they're going to get there and everything's going to be fine. But actually, you know, therapy has only marginal benefits as well. So I'm not... We have to work with what we have, um, but I don't necessarily think that therapy is the solution because I've been having it for a decade, and I know intellectually why I sometimes think and feel how I do, but in terms of how transformative it is, I often still feel the same, you know? Yeah. I have a therapy, a therapist that said Patsy, and I use it more. I think a therapy is just like guided talking and, 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 and discussions. And I, I do find it useful because I find it a way of debriefing. So it's not, it doesn't transform me, it just keeps me going in a way. Like, mm -hmm. uh, it's like oil in the machine. Um, going back to that issue, because I know we talked too about, you know, you say all you've got to offer is medicines and, you know, these, these, these medications. And you, we even wonder how useful or how successful are. There's a lot of evidence coming out about the, the lack of efficacy about SSRIs. And I know you were talking last night, we were talking about that, that you'd love to do it differently. And you mentioned this way over in the Nordic system, isn't it, about how they manage psychosis, which sounded much more dynamic and engaged. Yeah, so that's called uh, open dialogue, if people have heard of that. And it's a, a way of practicing that came from Finland, which was uh, a certainly less coercive, less paternalistic way of practicing psychiatry. So for people with psychosis, instead, often in, in this country, it's psychiatrists saying, you've got to take this or, some, or, or else we'll section you and then in hospital if you don't take it, you'll sometimes be physically restrained and made to have it. Which inherently just doesn't sound like a good kind of basis on which to give someone a treatment. But in, in, in Finland, they instead they flatten the hierarchy and they, they, they meet the pit. There's a kind of, uh, there's, uh, the, 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 they, are off, they can take medicine, but the, the control of the, that decision is down to the patient. And remarkably, instead of spending all their time saying, oh, you're taking your medicine, you've got to take your medicine, they put their time and efforts into other things like supporting them, like, uh, tying them in with their, their local uh, network, like their neighbors or their family. And they'll be much more flexible in their working. They'll have like a named nurse and a named psychiatrist, which I suppose is maybe how old care used to be, who will yeah. always, instead of this very fragmented healthcare system that we have at the moment who sometimes will even do things that sound crazy to us like stay over night with the patient if they're particularly scared and I guess they'll just be a bit more curious about their symptoms you talk about voice hearing instead of being yeah. like are you hearing voices yes okay you've got to take this to suppress the symptoms just being a bit more curious and thinking about how to how to live with them and fascinatingly the outcomes from that approach on things like returning to employment, like 93% return to employment after five years, compared to just seven with our current, you know, yeah. psychological, um, pharmacologically heavy, heavy model. So that's all being replicated in the UK at the moment. It'll be interesting to see what the actual, 
how it how it translates in this country. Because it sort of goes back in a sense, it's not just, you know, when you just give drugs, you don't give attention. And going back to what Ian then was talking about in Ash, that idea of giving attention, this is a system where they're getting attention, concentrated attention. I suppose it goes back to balance, you know, the idea mm. of the doctor as the drug and the, that it's the influence of the relationship. And I think since we've sort of gone a little very biomedical, it's the, course, we think it's the drug yeah. and not the relationship. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Yeah, so we are maybe losing, we, people might think that we're kind of losing or maybe talking ourselves out of a job, really, because if you don't yeah. need the drugs, well, why do you need the psychiatrists, Psychiatrist. right? But um, I'm not so attached to my job that I mind yeah. keeping myself in one. And just, I suppose, um, coming back to Malcolm, maybe to finish, because uh, I know myself, I, I worked in disability, and uh, we worked in uh, disability rights. And I remember attending a voice hearers group, and it was really interesting because these were people with, with we called them schizophrenia, they called themselves voice hearers, and they were actually as a group meeting to discuss how they interact with their voices. And of course, we all presume the voices are always negative, which they were, some of them were saying yeah, they're negative and how do I deal, but sometimes they weren't negative, they were just voices and they were just discussing yeah. things. So I, I liked the way you mentioned about Malcolm at the end, why he refused his medication when you, um, when you asked him would you like to increase his, his uh, antipsychotic. Yeah. yeah. And he, yeah, he says, um, he says, no, no, I'm okay, thanks. Like some of them are nice, and they keep me company. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, I'd like to say, open up to the audience now. So if we have the mics, and I like that idea. Of st 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 there's a v hand I can actually see. I thought I wouldn't be able to see. There's a hand over here. <laughs> um, so anyone with, maybe if you stand up, that was a good trick Ash had. Stand up if you want to ask a question. Thank you for a great talk, um, both of you. I'll definitely be buying that book. Um, I know everything is multifactorial and um, there's no exact science to anything of what any of us do. I wondered as a psychiatrist, have you put any thought into the gut microbiome and the causes of depression and anxiety? Did you More say gut microbes? Forms, the microbiome, the gut microbiome. I haven't because that, that to me again feels like looking for the, the cause of depression in the wrong places, really. Like, I, I remember I once said to my, um, one of my supervisors, there was a study had come out about how gardening in Manchester, some GPs in, uh, had, they did a study where they had half their patients with depression, did gardening, and the other half was starting on SSRI, SSRI. And the other, and the, the gardeners performed just as well as the SSRI group. And my um, boss's interpretation of that was, oh, there must be some gut microbes in the soil that are helping cure the depression. So I think looking for these things in, ke in chemistry is, it, we're overcomplicating it a lot of the time. To me, it seems more obvious that it's like the connecting and the having a purpose and the being in nature. These things that a lot of our patient group don't have that feel like a, a more fruitful thing to try and work on. And also, I, I sometimes about the language too, like depression, we've, I, I, and sometimes we've lost the language of sadness and loneliness. I was, read, I was reading an article recently which talked about how loneliness was associated with uh, suicidality. And they said, oh, that's because loneliness is associated with depressive symptoms. Where I thought, well, why wouldn't you commit suicide if you felt uh, very lonely? In a sense, that we've lost those rich terms of describing um, unhappiness. Yeah. Any more questions out there? Hi, Austin. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so, so, over here. Uh, oh, hi, Austin. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hi there. So we, we, we've, we've flirted this morning with uh, the power of pleasure and now with humor. And just on that point of balance with doctor as drug, I'm kind of interested in how we might, in this serious and technocratic and monitored age, um, use the, the drug of, of pleasure or the chemistry yeah. of dance or poetry or music and how we can turn that to our advantage in our consultations and stop just talking left brain and any experiences or thoughts on that? For me? Mm. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that social prescribing is kind of all the rage, isn't it? I suppose it's just about where these, the availability of these things, it still feels very abstract to me. There isn't yet the, the, the established things to offer these patients. And that's probably why more often than not we end up just turn into our prescription pads. Mm. But if such things became more available, that would be fantastic, yeah. 
I, I've always fantasized that I could prescribe a sun holiday on my GMS handbook. And uh, <laughs> that, would, that would boost their vitamin D. So, I mean, they'd be uh, much happier when they came back. Uh, uh, so it would be great to expand the range of therapeutic options. Any other questions out there? One down there, I think. Isn't Hi. Um, just reflecting on your personal experience with mental health, um, do you feel there's any link between perhaps people choosing psychiatry as a career because they've had personal experience of mental health difficulties or whether there's then a link of working in psychiatry as a cause and effect type thing? Now, I'm not saying any of these are definite, but I just wondered how you feel that perhaps shapes training in psychiatry and the experience as, your, as a doctor with your patients, the kind of pros and cons of that. Sure. Where are you? Sorry, I just don't know where to look. Oh, hey, hi. Yeah, definitely. It's kind of chicken and egg, isn't it? And, and I think, again, there was some really, a really good paper in the BMJ um, about how uh, someone who was looking at the well-being of medical students before they applied, to, even as medical students, they found that the group who were wanting to become psychiatrists were already more depressed than the other bunch. So I guess it's that, it's that bad mix of, 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 of attracting an inherently, perhaps slightly more damaged group of people and then them living around human misery during their work life mm -hmm. is not the best, you know, combo. Um, yeah, so I think, I, think I think both are, I think there's a bit of both in there, definitely. Certainly for me, and you know, one of my, one of the things, I think it's kind of, one of my book is quite personally revealing and open and, and uh, because I think, well, I hope that that might be helpful for, for people to see, you know, that even the, even the doctors, you know, and um, one of the things for me is like, I think growing up in my family, I had this kind of fantasy that going into psychiatry, I was going to get the secret codes, you know, to fix my own dysfunctional semi-mad family and then um, I'm still kind of looking for those codes, yeah. <laughs> But well, I suppose to finish up, in a sense, a slight answer to your question, the actual title of the book is You Don't Have to Be Mad to Work Here. Uh, so it answers the question, in a sense. Um, so don't forget, it's coming out in spring 2023. Uh, keep your eyes out on the bookshelves. Highly recommend it. A great read, not just funny, but as I said, honest, humorous, poignant, uh, and challenging. So thanks very much, Benji. Thank really you. Bye-bye. <laughs>